Francesca. We, in turn, are rejoined by my old House colleague, uh, former chairman of the Intelligence Committee there, Pete Hoekstra. We're also going to welcome along Jim Robbins, uh, who is uh, on the LigNet Advisory Board and a senior fellow for National Security Affairs at the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, to both Pete and Jim, welcome back to America's Forum. Great to be with Thank you. you. Thanks, J.D. Well, let's first get your reaction to what General Michael Hayden had to say about uh, Mr. Obama's foreign policy. This is what he told us. Take a listen to General Hayden. I mean, who out there is claiming that every problem has a military solution? No, no one's claiming that. And for, for him to say that's the other side of the argument, uh, I, why would he do that? Let's have a mature discussion. It, it is a fair argument to make that we have not been active enough. I was struck by another part of the speech, J.D. and John, where he seemed to take a victory lap for his policy towards the Ukraine. So let's uh, let's get your comments. Jim, we'll start with you. The president's uh, commencement speech yesterday at West Point. Yeah, um, I agree with the straw man aspect. There's no one who argues that military power is the only way to solve our problems in the world. No president has ever uh, maintained that, although it's a talking point that Mr. Obama used to use against George W. Bush. But I would point out that Mr. Bush uh, assembled a larger coalition for the Iraq war than Mr. Obama has managed to assemble for anything he's ever done. So there really was an element of uh, casting the argument in a way that he was going to win it. Uh, but in fact, nobody believes the things that Mr. Obama was saying his critics believe. What about it, Pete? Rank revisionism? Oh, I think it's rank revisionism. And, you know, J.D., you and I have sat in the House chamber often enough, and we've heard presidents give good speeches. And once again, Obama can give a speech with roaring uh, and soaring uh, rhetoric. Uh, it was interesting to note that the response from the audience, the cadets, was not all that positive. Uh, the second thing is, you know, when we were in the House and we were listening to those speeches, we very carefully uh, made sure that, you know, we had to take a look at the results on the ground. And the results of this president's foreign policy have been anything but what he talked about in that speech yesterday. Uh, sure, we've handled the threat from Al Qaeda in the PAC Afghan region, uh, but Al-Qaeda and the threat from radical Islam uh, has now spread. It's in the Arabian Peninsula. It's in the Middle East. It's in Northern Africa. It's in all these regions. Uh, you know, rather than a victory lap around Russia and the Ukraine, uh, Russia is doing a victory lap because Russia and China are now closer than they've been in a long time, just signing this massive natural gas deal. Uh, you know, now, we, uh, we're a country... That has to have a serious discussion about foreign policy, about how we can do this in a bipartisan way to move forward uh, and re-exert American influence, and it doesn't have to be militarily. Many would say that, that this, uh, this speech was actually damaging for America in the sense that it provided an opportunity for enemies and, and showed a weakness to our allies. What would your thoughts on that be? To, to Pete. Oh, okay. The, uh, you know, again, I don't think they're looking at this speech and saying, you know, this is one more indication of a, uh, a weak president or a weak America. They just look at uh, this president's uh, and this administration's record in its totality. The, you know, the line in the sand in Syria, uh, engaging with the Iranian regime rather than the Green Revolution. Uh, dumping Mubarak, dumping Gaddafi, uh, and all of those types of things to get the totality of the picture. I think, again, they look at what's happening on the ground rather than a speech. This president gave a, a very similar speech in 2009 uh, at, uh, at West Point, and we're way beyond looking at speeches. They now have a track record of six years of action or inaction by this president. Uh, that they are, excuse me, that they are focused on. And yet there was the speech yesterday. So, Jim, I want to get your take. We're going to listen to another excerpt of the president's speech uh, about the use of force. And then, Jim, I'd like your reaction. But U.S. military action cannot be the only 
or even primary component of our leadership in every instance. Just because we have the best hammer does not mean that every problem is a nail. Well, interesting, the hammer and nail analogy, although I'm, well, I'll get your take on it, Jim. It seems a, a bit faulty at best, though rather picturesque in terms of a speech. I would say so. It's ironic that the most successful things that he's done, like taking down Osama bin Laden or uh, the drone campaign against the core Al-Qaeda network, <laughs> are the kinetic aspects. I mean, that's, that's the hammer. And those are things that he's done pretty well. But he talks a lot about he wants to shift to diplomacy or we need multilateralism and so forth. Where is his track record of success with his own metrics? Where has he had a stunning foreign policy success through diplomacy? Has it been the Israeli-Palestinian issue? Has it been in Iran? Uh, has it been with North Korea? Where exactly has he gotten the job done using the tools that he says are the most important ones? I really don't see a record of success on anything outside of a very narrow range of victories. Well, on the heels of that hammer and nail metaphor, the president went on to say something even more interesting. Listen to this. The United States will use military force unilaterally if necessary when our core interests demand it. When our people are threatened, when our livelihoods are at stake, when the security of our allies is in danger. On the other hand, when issues of global concern do not pose a direct threat to the United States, when such issues are at stake, when, when crises arise that stir our conscience or push the world in a more dangerous direction, but do not directly threaten us, then the threshold for military action must be higher. The president went on to say, let me quote him now, America has, been, has rarely been stronger relative to the rest of the world. Those who would argue otherwise, who suggest that America is in decline or has seen its global, global leadership slip away, are either misreading history or engaged in partisan <clears throat> politics. The odds of a direct threat against us by any nation are low and do not come close to the dangers we faced in the Cold War. Pete Hoekstra, you and I are not strangers to uh, running for public office. The president is done. He's in his second term. Is he trying to prime the pump to tap into something that's been poll tested in terms of a growing theory of isolationism or at least disengagement uh, militarily <clears throat> abroad. Is that what he's doing? Uh, I really don't know what he's doing. I think he's trying to walk a very tight uh, center line there between you know, engaging militarily or isolationism. And what he's saying is, hey, I'm staking out the middle ground. That's where the United States needs to be. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> again, he, he did not lay out an overall Obama philosophy on foreign policy. He did not lay out a policy that when you compare the speech to what he's actually done uh, over the last six years, uh, you know, that they are closely related, and he really hasn't laid out a footprint so that we could look at a situation in the world today and say, based on the speech that he gave, this is the likely course of action. And in that kind of ambiguity, America will be tested. We will be tested by al-Qaeda. We will be tested by Russia, and we will be tested to China to see if the president has drawn a line in the sand anywhere that he'll actually stand up and demonstrate what his foreign policy is. Jim, why wouldn't Americans be afraid of the democratic view of national, national security now? Why should they be afraid of why it? Why wouldn't they be at this, at this why time? Why wouldn't they be? Well, I think they should be. I think the president's kind of out of touch with reality. He said that by every measure, our relative strength is still uh, strong. But our global share of GDP is declining. Global share of uh, defense expenditures is declining. The Army's cutting troops, the Navy's cutting ships, the Air Force is cutting planes. He is unilaterally building down our nuclear forces. I really don't know what other measures he's talking about that show that the United States is remaining strong in the world. Even if you look at global opinion, uh, not just of world leaders who obviously hold our president in contempt, but of people around the world, particularly like key states in the Middle East, 
the United States is more hated now than it was during the George W. Bush administration. So I really don't know what measures he's talking about. James Robbins and Pete Hoekstra, we thank you gentlemen again for joining us to offer your perspectives on what President Obama had to say in what was supposed to be a commencement address, but uh, Francesca appeared to be revisionist history. Tell you what, we'd love to have your take on this. Was the president right to recast American foreign policy? What is your view? We'd love to hear from you. Why don't you tweet us your comments at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum. There's also email our address, connect at NewsmaxTV.com. And let's not forget Facebook, y'all. It's Facebook.com backslash Newsmax. And we're coming right back.